Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily O'Grady, and as a crime writer, I'm very excited to introduce tonight's event, Crime Culture with Tara Moss, part of the Talking Ideas series. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land upon which we meet, as well as elders past, present, and emerging. The State Library acknowledges all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. The conversation tonight will explore crime fiction, writing, and strong women working in a predominantly male world. Tara will be speaking with author, author Cass Moriarty. They will join us shortly. The State Library is a respected cultural institution and provides a safe and welcoming space for everyone. Tonight's event is part of our Talking Ideas series, which aims to entertain, inspire and foster debate, addressing issues that inform our times and shape our lives. Speakers at events hold a wide range of views and come from diverse backgrounds. Similarly, there may be differing points of views among our audience tonight. I encourage you to listen respectfully. Following the conversation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please save your questions until the end and I ask, that you ensure that you ask a question and not provide a comment. As you came in tonight, you will have noticed some rolling images from the State Library's online digital image collection. They represent images of Queensland women. This was just a small insight into the Queensland stories you can explore in the State Library collection. Tara Moss is the best-selling, award-winning author of 12 books, including The Fictional Woman, the Mac van der Waal crime fiction series, and the Pandora English paranormal series. She is also a journalist, doctoral candidate, presenter, documentary co-producer and co-writer, model and advocate for children's rights and women's rights. Never one to do things by halves, Tara has toured the FBI Academy at Quantico, spent time in squad cars, morgues and prisons, and just like her heroine, Billy Walker, has her private investigator credentials from the Australian Security Academy. Our chair this evening is Cass Moriarty, who has published two novels, Parting Words and The Promise Seed, the latter shortlisted for the Queensland Literary Awards. Cass has been a judge for the QLAs and is a writing mentor both privately and through the Queensland Writers' Centre. She has appeared at the Brisbane Writers' Festival as both a guest and a moderator. Please welcome Tara Moss and Cass Moriarty. <laughs> We've got the next little while to get attached, I think, Cass. Thanks. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you, Emily, for that introduction. Um, and Tara Moss, welcome to Brisbane. My pleasure. I love Brisbane and hello. It's nice to be back. It's lovely to see such a full room too. Great. Um, Tara, I think you're the perfect guest for the Talking Ideas program because you have such a varied and interesting life and because your fiction is informed by your experiences, your feminism and your advocacy in many mm. spheres. In fact, listening to Emily um, read your bio tonight was just a little bit exhausting, wasn't it? <laughs> um, nobody could accuse you of being an underachiever. Honestly, what are the rest of us doing with our time? <laughs> Uh, so we do have a lot to talk about tonight, um, and as it, Emily said, we'll leave time for audience questions at the end, but I wanted to start with um, the reason that you're currently here on tour in Australia, to promote your crime fiction novel, Dead Man Switch, which is the beginning of what I suspect is going to be a very popular series. We'll have no spoilers tonight, <laughs> so don't worry about that, but we will set the scene and talk a little bit about the key characters. So the book is set in Sydney just after the end of World War II and features P.I. Billy Walker, a smart, strong, savvy and sexy female protagonist with attitude. Might I say not unlike yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, Tara, could you tell us a little bit about Billy Walker and her situation when the novel opens? 
So I'm obsessed with the 1940s, and I grew up with stories of World War II uh, from my family. So I've always been very interested in this period, and interested as well in the women of grit from this time. Um, women from film noir, the women of hard-boiled fiction. Of course, the women of hard-boiled fiction, I wanted to make a little bit of a twist on that, because often they were, you know, femme fatales were literally the fatal women that usually died in, mm. in hard-boiled fiction. So I wanted to take a genre that I adore and, and twist it a little bit. And my protagonist, who's, I think, perfect for that particular job, is Billy Walker. Um, we recently sold this book into the US and Canada, I'm very happy to say. And when the news broke in the trades, someone had written a kind of apt description of Billy, Billy Walker. It was one I hadn't written myself, and I had the great delight of actually seeing her through someone else's eyes. And they said, she was a staunchly feminist, champagne-swilling, fast-driving Nazi hunter. <laughs> 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 and I was like, Boom! I mean, yeah. like, I want to be part of that girl yeah, gang. Yeah, she is, she is. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Billy Walker. Um, that's a very succinct way of describing her character. She is, as it says in the back cover, kind of a, you know, a woman living in a man's world yeah. in some respects. She has what we would call traditionally masculine and traditionally feminine ca characteristics. And I was very passionate about including both of those. Mm. I think she's the first um, detective in fiction who solves murders, but also darns her own stockings. Um, I think she she's might be. Yeah. yeah, she's true to the 1940s. It's appropriate during mm. the time of Make, Do, and Mend that you would have a woman like this. Mm. So Billy Walker is many things, but she certainly defies expectations. She is unusual for a woman of her time, but also, I believe, very authentic mm. to the time. Perhaps she is the type of character that we haven't her read about before, but was very much present in 1946. Mm. Great. Well, this might be a, a really good time for you to um, read a couple sure. of pages. Yes, for I'd us, love if to, you Cass. Would. Thank you. So I'm just going to read a couple of pages. I won't bore you too much. So I'll just give you um, a little bit of an introduction um, from chapter one, and it. It introduces us to Billy Walker, as you mentioned, hopefully a character who will be continuing in fiction for some time. And this is uh, the first words uh, about her. Billy Walker was right back in the moment. The sun was warming her face, a world of abstract technicolor behind her eyes as she closed her lids against a brief gust of wind, turning the corner on Steffensplatz. Each detail was so clear, so present even now. There was the smell of something baked in the air, a shop's delicious daily offerings of satchetort and apple strudel. She'd laughed at something Jack had said. She could feel his large, reassuring hand in hers as they walked, their world a bubble of new love and the excitement of foreign soil and the thrill of a story. No caution, no fear. Their leather shoes clicked on the cobblestones, and she could hear voices beyond the corner, then a shouting that pulled her from her reverie. Her reporter's notepad was in her hand in an instant, and she broke from Jack and looked down to catch the pencil that was slipping. When she looked up, she saw it. She stopped in her tracks as Jack already had. The world came rushing in, shattering the illusion of safety. A dozen women were on their knees in the large square, surrounded by men in uniform. They were weeping quietly as their heads were shaved. She saw blood and hair, naked skin and tears. A man was in his underthings on the street beside them, cowering, his back bloodied, his beard shaved, his yarmulke crushed on the ground beside him. A crowd watched. Some of them were shouting, their fists raised. Billy couldn't hear what they were saying through the sound of the blood pumping in her ears. Just as the urge to run forward and intervene struck her, one of the stormtroopers turned, caught her eye. She looked away in an instant, as if the gaze would burn her. She closed her eyes. What they saw in Vienna was always there, just waiting for her lids to close. One day in 1938, she'd opened her eyes to find it, and now it was there each time she closed them. A kind of reversal. Why those memories? Why that weekend? 
It was all wrapped up in Jack, in the war, and everything she had to somehow leave behind now, everything that her head told her was over, but her heart still clung to. Billy shook herself gently and gathered up her things. There was no sense in lingering on memories, even if they wouldn't let her go just yet. She wasn't in Europe anymore. She was back in Australia. It was 1946, a new world, and she had to make a new life in it. She had to, and she would. The tram was slowing, pulling up next to Central. She removed a small gilded compact and lipstick from her handbag and reapplied a touch of Tussie's fighting red. This was her stop. It was time to rise. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. My cane falls so often. <laughs> I apologize if it does so later. <laughs> that was really interesting that you that you chose to read that piece because mm. my first question was going to be about the traumatic incident that yep. Billy witnessed in mm. 1938 and yes. how that affected her mm. um, afterwards. So maybe if you could talk to us a little bit about what effect that did have for her and yeah. also about um, her relationship with her husband Jack and the work yes. that they did together, which was, is really yeah. fascinating. So what I've done is created a couple of characters that to me um, sum up some of this sort of the, the power of regular people during World War II. The, uh, her husband is a photojournalist and Billy a reporter, and they fell in love during this time of great upheaval, um, as happened to so many people in World War II. These were you know, intense moments together, snatches of time together during uh, a time of um, you know, great despair in many ways and, and excitement. And really, she was chasing Nazi activity across Europe before she had to return to Australia. Now she's back in Australia, and it's, you know, World War II is over, but the long shadow of war continues for a long time after war has ended. Um, I've, I'm really interested in how it's impacted regular people. And there's no one in this book who's been untouched by World War II, because I think that's realistic. W what we often see and hear about, of course, are the people who are on the front lines, particularly the, the people high up who are making the decisions. We see their statues in our town squares, and those are people who should be remembered and experiences that need to be remembered. But there are also the experiences of regular people who didn't have titles like that. Um, and there's the experiences of women. There's the experiences of kids who were around then. Um, and those are the experiences, I think, that in Dead Man's Switch really come to the fore. Billy and Jack, you know, were passionately chasing the Nazis and trying to kind of inform the world about what was going on before um, before that was as well known as it is today. Uh, but of course, he's gone missing, and now she's essentially a war widow. She doesn't know what's happened to him, and that would have been a very common experience for people at that time. You know, not knowing what's happened to your loved ones and not having that closure. I could keep going on and on about them, <laughs> but I love I love these characters, it's and a I really love nice really, even though he's absent. It's he's a really beautiful. He's absent, and you can you can feel her connection to him, and also you know that knowledge that during times of war there's that incredible intensity that you know being on the edge of survival all the time really does bond and connect people, uh, and you can't just walk away from that. Mm. It's not like they have a victory in the Pacific Day and suddenly everything's back to normal. Mm. Things are changed irrevocably, and that is true for, indeed, all the characters in Dead Man's Switch. Mm. Mm. And the title of the novel, Dead Man's Switch, um, very cleverly refers to a couple of things which we can't talk about. Yes. But <laughs> just in a practical <laughs> sense, yes. are you able to tell us what that term means? Actually, or would you rather not? I will. Um, okay, good. In chapter one, there's a mention of a Dead Man Switch, and I, I won't read this whole section, but I'll just have a little look. There we go. Because well, I've never heard I of it before. Oh, you hadn't? No. Okay. So in chapter one, we're introduced to John Wilson, who's a, a lift operator in Daking House. Um, and now all the locations, except for one in Dead Man Switch, are real-life locations that still exist 
in Australia that you could go and do the Sydney tour or the Billy Walker Sydney tour if you <laughs> wanted to, <laughs> hop on a plane tomorrow and go and check out these locations. And in fact, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see in the stories that I'll often, yeah, I'm seeing a few people nodding. I'm <laughs> taking pictures and video of some of these locations so you can read the book and actually see like Billy Walker's balcony at Daking House, for example, where she stands there and she has her cigarette and looks out and considers the world. It's a real balcony in a real building that's still there. So uh, this scene takes place in Daking House where Billy Walker has her office as a private inquiry agent and John Wilson is the lift operator. Um, they rode up in the, ca uh, in the cab um, and the cab was rattling. How is June, Billy, as she often did, inquired after Wilson's wife and the children? Very well, thank you for asking, he said, and his mouth moved into an uneven smile, his eyes crinkling warmly. He slowed the lift at the sixth floor, jogging the lever up and down a couple of times to line it up with the hallway outside. He let go of the handle too suddenly and the elevator lurched, the dead man's switch kicking in. Apologies, Miss Walker, just as well we've got the switch to uh, stop us if my hand slips, he said, reddening slightly beneath his scars. If you didn't keep your hands continuously on the lift control, you could activate the mechanism. The actual death of the man operating it wasn't necessary to set it off. Wilson was new to his certificate, but it happened to those with more experience, too. He pulled the grill doors open. Watch your step. Always, Billy replied, and flashed him a smile. She walked along the hall, passing offices already humming with activity, until she arrived at a wooden door fitted with a frosted glass window, a simple title painted in black across it, B. Walker Private Inquiries. Mm. So that gives us an idea of what a dead man switch is. Yes. It yes. is a mechanism so that that elevator doesn't plunge if suddenly yes. someone is not holding on to the mechanism yeah. anymore. Thank goodness elevators have moved on. So indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Um, Tara, in general, why do you think crime fiction is so popular with readers? Mm. I mean, um, we just we seem to be drawn because endlessly. Because it's good. Well, it's good, <laughs> yes. But we're sort of endlessly drawn to characters mm. um, that are psychologists or detectives or investigators. What, what, what do you think it is that draws us as readers back to crime fiction? I think I can speak as a reader and as an author... I am drawn to this genre because it explores social issues. Mm -hmm. It explores taboos. It explores what's going on beneath the, the veneer of civilized calm mm -hmm. in, in our world. Um, yes, it does so often you know, in, in the form of entertainment, mm -hmm. but it is a way for us as readers and as human beings to explore and think about and consider some of the dark aspects of life mm. because it's not always roses, is it? Mm. You know? Mm. So I, I think that crime fiction does have an important place in our psyche as human beings, being able to actually look at our face our fears, explore our fears. I mean, it's appropriate perhaps that it's October and Halloween is coming up and it makes me think in North America when I was growing up how there was this day where you would, you know, seek out things that spooked you. Um, and you could say the same of haunted houses or roller coaster rides or scary movies. These actually play a role in, uh, particularly in our formative years. Mm -hmm. As a young person, I was reading Stephen King novels, you know, mm -hmm. when I was 10, and I wrote Stephen King style novelettes for my classmates <laughs> in school. And it was part of our way as young people to kind of explore these taboos in these areas and kind of push the boundaries of what we were comfortable with. Mm. So I think that um, it is natural and normal, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in crime fiction, yeah. um, I do think, of course, there's a lot of uh, legitimate criticisms that can be aimed at crime fiction. There's probably better ways and, and, and less um, healthy ways to, to write these books. I'm not the police for that. You can do what you what you like or read what you like, but I do think it's a really uh, strong and legitimate form of literature, and mm -hmm. it plays uh, an important role. It's part of this mechanism we have as human beings, where we explore the things that scare us, mm -hmm. and you know, w we only need to look at the newspaper headlines to know mm -hmm. that the uh, the topics that are in crime novels are based on real life mm 
yeah. and the real dangers that do exist, even if, if they focus more on the ones that are rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they and do. do you think that people find it more satisfying too because generally in a crime novel there is a resolution? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, because as a reader, you usually have a bit of a pact with the author. You understand mm -hmm. that they're probably going to give you some sense of resolution at mm -hmm. the end. Um, I don't always do that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't always uh, provide a neat ending. Mm. And I guess I believe that there should be a resolution of the plot line, but not yes. necessarily a safe and perfect world um, no, that arrives at the end. Um, mm. So it varies from author to author, but you're right. Mm. The conventions of the genre generally require that you have a crime that's taken place and then is solved by the end. Mm. And um, yeah, that that gives us a sense of satisfaction as readers, mm. absolutely. Mm. We certainly want the mystery or elements of the mystery yes. to be solved, if not justice served in the traditional sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, getting back to this particular book, um, Billy's assistant cum secretary mm -hmm. is the dashing and rather charming Sam. Um, could you tell us a bit about Sam, his personality, his role, and mm. why Billy likes having him around? Do you know why he's called Sam? No. Dashiell Hammett would roll in his grave. I named him Sam for Sam Spade because I wanted <laughs> Billy Walker <laughs> to have a male secretary. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam Baker, Perfect. yeah. I, I mean, again, as a nod to the genre and to the greats, mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with Raymond Chandler and I'm obsessed with uh, Dashiell Hammett. And, you know, I was wearing a Maltese Falcon badge earlier, so. <laughs> You know, I'm a diehard fan. So Dashiell Hammett would either go hooray or roll in his grave <laughs> knowing that I've, um, I've called Billy Walker's secretary, uh, Sam, as a nod to Sam Spade. Samuel Baker is a returned uh, soldier, mm -hmm. as so many of um, the male characters are in this book, and that was the reality of the time. And he's um, returned from the war with disabilities. He has um, some missing fingers on, on one hand, and he's therefore finding it especially difficult to find work. Now, the returned soldiers had a great deal of difficulty finding work, regardless, but add to that the fact that he can't do certain types of manual labor anymore. Mm. Um, they laugh about how he's maybe not a great typist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's part of you know their, their jokes around the office. But he is her secretary slash assistant, so he's um, manning the front desk, and I use that term very uh, deliberately. <laughs> Because she's a woman working in a, a, an mm -hmm. occupation where people do expect a male PI for the most part, and where uh, she gets a lot of female clients. Uh, in 1946, you needed to get um, proof of adultery, for example, to get a divorce. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult to get divorces, and this made um, uh, private investigators uh, a necessary part of the well, part of the legal system, mm. essentially, uh, a quite maligned profession, but a necessary one. And of course, you're going to have disgruntled husbands coming in from time to time. So Sam, s you know, uh, plays a lot of roles for her in terms of, um, you know, being that man at the front desk who can kind of be a buffer mm. or sometimes just provide a little bit of... Um, a little bit of what someone else is expecting. They'll call him, you know, Mr. Walker, thinking, well, he must be the investigator um, yeah. rather than her sidekick. Sam's a, just a wonderful character and I think gives us some real insights into um, some of the experiences of the returned serviceman. Mm. He also looks like Alan Ladd. If you're into film noir, <laughs> you'll know <laughs> who I mean. Um, and the two of them make a wonderful pair together. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, I'm having a bit of fun by giving her a male secretary, but it's also, I think, authentic to the time because, as I said, it was very difficult to get work and probably someone like Sam Baker, had he not had these experiences mm. in the war and come back physically changed, he probably wouldn't be working for a woman. Mm. But he is, and they get on like a wonderful team. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's, it's really a wonderful team. way of looking at those gender dynamics um, and yeah, I think, as I wrote Sam, he ended up becoming a bigger character, mm -hmm. had more mm -hmm. of a role because he just is um, just, a, just a wonderful, oh, I just love him. Yeah. Oh, he's just dreamy. <laughs> he's just dreamy. I love Sam. Yeah, I love Sam. He's I'll stop babbling character. about okay, him. He's, he's really, a <laughs> he's, ma he's marvelous. And as so often happens when you're, you know, div creating a world of fiction, 
some of the characters just really come to life and, and become much mm. more prominent mm. than you maybe initially intended, and he's one of those. Mm. Yeah, he, d he definitely is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about Billy. Um, frequently throughout the book, Billy refers to her women's intuition. Yes. Or as she calls it, that little woman in her stomach that yeah. tells her when something is wrong. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that this is a trait unique to Billy, or do you think that this is something that all women have mm. and that we maybe choose to ignore it sometimes mm. at our peril? Two things. One, um, she refers to the little woman in her gut as a direct reference to the hard-boiled genre because there are a number of films from that time and books from that time where the guys return to the refer the little men in their guts, the, you know, the little man in my belly who tells me, you know. So it's my way of subverting that or referencing that. But also, straight out of the gate, um, she has a client come into her office who says she's there for, she needs some women's intuition, and we have Billy's thoughts on that. Of course, she doesn't tell the client this, but she doesn't believe in women's intuition. She does believe in gut instinct, but she doesn't think it's unique just to women. She just okay. thinks that women are particularly good listeners and observers, but so is her dad. And she learned that from the PI trade. And I think her line is something along, um, her, her thought process rather, is something along the lines of, you know, when it's, uh, um, when a man has those um, instincts, it's called knowledge. <laughs> and when a woman, a woman has them, it's intuition. It's this sort of airy-fairy kind of mysterious thing. And she rejects that outright. But she does respect the instinct in her gut because she knows it's informed by real solid mm -hmm. things. She's seeing body language. She's smelling something in the air. Mm -hmm. She's got all this knowledge and preparation in the background that her subconscious is working through. Mm -hmm. So that instinct she has is not a an airy-fairy, mystical thing, it's based on deduction and knowledge, and it's something to be listened to. But yeah, the little woman in her gut is a direct um, reference to the, uh, the period films and literature, yeah. where it al was always a, a male character with that. Great. Um, in the book, on, on page 34, Billy's speaking, and she says, I'm not trouble she said soothingly to the boy, <laughs> trying to ease his nerves or perhaps her own, although the statement wasn't strictly true if history was anything to go by. She and Trouble knew each other pretty well. <laughs> Is this some sort of foreshadowing of what's to come in future books for Billy or what's, or maybe... I thought you were going to ask me if that's based on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I yeah. just assumed it was based yes on me. Yes to both. <laughs> yes to both. Um, yeah, well it would be a pretty boring book series if things yeah. always went to plan for her um, and if trouble didn't come sniffing around. Um, she's, of course, also in an occupation where trouble knocks on the door. I mean, that's, you know, there's a reference at the start of the book about all these other people who work in Daking House and how they arrive at 9 a.m. and the clients come in and how, you know, in her trade, a client's not going to knock at 9 a.m., but midnight is not mm -hmm. entirely unheard of. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, people come to Billy for the things they don't want to handle themselves because they're either too dangerous mm -hmm. or too fraught mm -hmm. for some other reason. Mm -hmm. So she is literally being handed trouble as a job. And um, she either had the choice to do that, to reopen her late father's um, private investigation agency, or to stick with reporting and when she returned from the war after chasing, you know, uh, the Nazis across Europe, she was, you know, invited to, yes, cover the Easter show for the local paper and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe the weather, right? So she, she felt it's far too much of a downgrade. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They wanted all the, the women reporters to go back to the kitchen. Thank you very much for, for your work over mm -hmm. the period of the war. You can go home now. And she was never one of those women and wasn't going to become one. So this is mm. kind of a necessary, it's not a necessary evil, but it's, you know, necessary trouble for her. Mm. Well, she definitely handles trouble <laughs> well. Yes. yes. She, has, she has no trouble handling trouble. That's right. Her um, uses of a hat pin are notable. Oh, I was going to mention that <laughs> later. Yeah, I won't give too much later. away, but a few people who've <laughs> read this, yes, a few people have read that scene. Um, in the novel, Billy has an acquaintance with a real-life historical figure, mm. Special Sergeant First Class Lillian Armfield, one of Australia's first female police mm. detectives who joined in 1915. 
the women share similar robust ambitions and business-like attitudes to their professions. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Lillian Armfield and how hard was it for her to forge her way at that time and mm. what were some of the practical difficulties that she mm. had to contend with as a female? Now, you know, if you have one of those post-it notes for that page, I would love to read that paragraph, mm. actually. So Maybe Lillian Armfield is the only um, historical figure in the book who speaks. I'm very careful about... Uh, to be sensitive about um, real-life characters and also locations. In fact, I mentioned that there are all these real-life locations except one. The reason why one of them is made up, which is called The Dancers, um, a club that's a reference to the Raymond Chandler books, is because nefarious things happen there and I didn't want to get in trouble with someone's family <laughs> talking about, you know, my grandfather ran that club and he was not a <laughs> nefarious gangster. <laughs> Thank right you for finding that. that. That's right perfect. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, I suppose, I mean, inc her inclusion and in part of this paragraph is really my way as a writer and as a, a, a someone interested in women's rights and women's experiences, my way of shining a light on some of these incredible human beings from the past and um, the difficulties that they had to, to work through. So... This young man has, um, she's trying to interview him, and he says, you know, you're not a police officer, are you? And she, um, she's like, no, do I seem like a cop? And he says, but they've been recruiting them lately. I read about it in the paper. At this, Billy had to resist rolling her eyes. In 41, when the panic set in about the lack of able men, the New South Wales police had added six women officers to the force, bringing the grand total to a mere 14 in the state. But now Premier McKell had approved an increase in the number of female cops to 36, and the papers were going mad with the idea, as if the fairer sex might suddenly take over the entire force, leaving men out of work or, heaven forbid, waiting for their dinners, despite <laughs> the fact married women weren't being accepted anyhow. Billy was on a first-name basis with the famous special sergeant, first class, Lillian Armfield, who had joined the force in 1915 and, through her, knew well enough the struggle. The female recruits hadn't even uniforms, weren't paid overtime like the boys, nor were they entitled to either superannuation or a pension. They had to sign contracts stating that they wouldn't be compensated for any injuries suffered in the line of duty, couldn't join the police association, and had to resign if they married one of the reasons Lillian never had. With all that, it was a wonder so many women were keen to sign up, but the applications always far outnumbered the spaces allotted. So just mm. think about that, yeah, the amazing. reality of working at that time as a police officer. We had a, a launch in Blackheath recently in the Blue Mountains, and there are scenes that play out in the Blue Mountains as well. And two New South Wales um, homicide detectives were there, um, and Sarah and Michelle, and they're amazing women. And, you know, even in the 90s when I started researching um, with the Australian police, there were very few women, and now there are many more in the homicide division and, and all through policing, and they contribute a great deal. Mm. Mm. And there's, a, there's um, a great book by Lee Straw about Lillian Armfield. And yes. I think in 1915, they, they could, women couldn't even make arrests they couldn't yes, carry right. a weapon. Yeah, I, I think she was the first one who. I think Lillian Armfield, in New South Wales at least, was the first female police officer who was allowed to use a weapon, a weapon. at all. Yeah. And she'd been in the force for some time when she was yeah. given, granted that <laughs> pleasure. You wonder how effective they would be, really, if they ca can't make arrests and they don't have a weapon. Yeah, <laughs> and thinking about what was happening in New South Wales in, say, the yeah. 20s, the Razor Gang Wars. I mean, do you want to go wandering around without? any sidearm or anything else at your disposal, like when they're wielding razors and all sorts of things. So, you know, she was a pretty tough uh, pioneering mm. woman. And again, it's a small role in the book, but it's uh, my way of trying to show, uh, have some sort of tribute to some of these incredible pioneering mm. humans. Mm. Just a quick question about um, Billy's mother. 
yes. the Baroness von Hooft. Yes. Is that how you pronounce That's it? That's correct. Um, she gives Billy three gifts chosen because she recognises the value of the skills mm. associated. I just wondered if you could quickly tell us what those yes, three gifts are. Yes, and these are skills specifically that Ella herself does not possess. Yeah. So she gives her uh, only child, her daughter, a sewing machine. So mm -hmm. she can make any type of clothing and can get into any kind of room. And Billy does use that very much to her advantage in her um, investigation work. She gives her a fast car so she can go anywhere. And she gives her a gun because she needs to say s stay safe in her profession. And Billy has a, a little colt which she um, straps to her thigh in a, a garter that she's specially sewn and designed <laughs> herself because, um, of course, all the holsters are meant to be worn under men's style of clothing. Yeah. And she's, you know, she sews her own clothing so she can have this sidearm there. That's perfect. Which ends up, you know, she's, uh, personally, I don't much like sidearms, but it was very important for her in her trade at that time in 1946. And um, it comes in handy for her to just at least know that it's there. Yeah. So her mother was very wise yeah. indeed. We too. all need a mother like that. We need a mother who, <laughs> you know, her mom does it, can't drive, can't sew, and can't shoot a gun. I love that she sees in her daughter yeah. that she's this different and more modern woman living in different circumstances and that these are the, the things that can get her through whatever mm. she needs mm. to survive. Yeah. And Billy is really an original sort of enigma. Th as we've talked about, mm. she, she loves driving fast cars and wearing beautiful, fashionable clothing and bright red lipstick. She enjoys a drink. She's very direct and competent. She knows what she wants and how to get it. Um, but she's also not above using her feminine wiles to yes. sort of get, get information. Or adjusting the seams on her yes, stockings. Yes, exactly, exactly. When she's trying to distract. Yes. So why was it important for you to create such a unique fictional woman mm. full of seeming contradictions and contrasts? Mm. And why do we need strong female characters in fiction, even or maybe especially in historical fiction, when they might actually not have been perhaps less visible in real life mm. than today? How long have we got? Um, oh, we're actually running out of time, do we, so make it quick. Why <laughs> do we need strong women in fiction? Oh my goodness, mm. I've written books about this. There, you know, the data keeps coming back showing us that um, in award-winning children's fiction, nearly twice as many central protagonists are male than female, you know. And in our award-winning adult fiction, the stuff that we uh, celebrate award and which is best selling is very often um, male centered and male focused. And I love a lot of these stories, you know, and we do in my family as well. We love our Harry Potters and we love these incredible men's stories and boys' stories. But I want to also have stories about women where they are driving the, the plot, they are the central protagonists, and those stories have been less told. So it's my, one of my missions as an author is to try to be part of um, getting those numbers a little bit mm. more on, on par. Mm. Now, there's a character named Shyla, for example, mm. in this book, who's a uh, Wiradjuri woman. She's an Aboriginal woman who is an informant for Billy. Billy and Shyla are a wonderful team. Ella, her mum, and her lady's maid, Alma, are also a wonderful team. And I think they all have the ring of truth about mm. them. Mm. They're all extraordinary, but not impossible characters. Mm. And I think what we really see when we look back at, um, at fiction from this time is that these were the sort of untold stories or the mm. stories that weren't as celebrated. Someone might say, oh, she's, you know, she does all these things. She wouldn't have ex existed at the time. I go, no, no. Women like this did exist, mm. actually. We just didn't hear about them. We didn't hear about them. We didn't celebrate them. We didn't um, tell and retell their stories. So I hope you love Billy in the world that she's in and acknowledge that the women that are in this world could have and, in fact, did exist, but we haven't really given them mm. statues in town squares. Mm. And if you dig into World War II as well, you see there are incredible women like Irina Sendler, who saved thousands of Jewish children, women whose names are not on the, you know, the edge of our tongue, like Schindler, for example, right? So I guess as an author, that's one of my missions. But also, it's really fun to tell the, the untold stories. Mm. And um, I think that's 
one of the joys of Dead Man's Switch is it's just a genuinely great romp, but it does introduce us to characters we maybe haven't read before. Mm. Mm. And Billy is so resourceful. You mentioned the, yes. the hat pin. I absolutely love the, the small details in this book. Yes. So she uses a hat pin to pick locks. Yes. And there's one instance where she picks up the hat pin, has a look at the ornamental pearl on the end of it and decides that she likes that <laughs> hat pin way too much to use it to pick a lock. So she has to she's choose like, a I don't want to bend this one. I don't want to bend that one. Survive. That's, <laughs> so That's right. Yeah, she's and she also uses the hat pin as a weapon at one stage as well. But these are, these are the things at hand. This, yes. is the, this is the show, again, of the resilience and adaptability of the characters in the book. And I think that rings true to the people at the time, the men and women, of that time in the 40s, they had to be incredibly adaptable with what they had on hand. Mm. And um, I think Billy's a shining example yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your non-fiction mm. books, um, which are both focused in different ways on feminism and the attitudes to women that you've had yes. explored in your fiction. Um, your first book, The Fictional Woman, was a combination of memoir and social analysis and explored many of the difficulties that you've had to navigate in your career. Uh, one example which I remember clearly happening at the time and which sums up the sort of the weirdness of that time <laughs> was the outrage in 2002 when mm. apparently you were deemed too glamorous and too sexy to possibly be smart enough to write your own books and you actually took a polygraph to prove otherwise. This That's is a lie true. detector test. I am test. not making this up. This is yep. true. I was dared by the Australian newspaper to take a polygraph test to prove that I write my own books. Oh, my God. So... Guilty as charged, <laughs> I am an author. I have a 33-page report proving it, and I am perhaps the only scientifically proven author in the world. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it, you're right, it's bonkers. It's, it's bonkers. bonkers. If not yeah. for stereotypes, I don't think um, that would have come about. Uh, so the fictional woman is about examining the fictions around women yes. and girls. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we all have fictions. Men and boys have fictions about them as well, fictions and stereotypes and labels. But I wanted to examine specifically the ones that we, that we tend to level at mm. women and girls and, and how b basically the danger of those labels. Mm. You know, they, mm. they really don't inform us um, and they can box people into to little categories that really don't, express their full humanity. Mm. And you yourself are, like all of us I guess, but you are many women, you're an international fashion model, or you, you were, you're an author, you're an advocate. I'm now a grey model, I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, there was a while I felt like I really wanted to drop the model tag. I got really sick of being called a model turned author, and like after 12 books I could feel especially sick of it. But I'm 46 and I've grown up. I think you should own it. Yeah, I actually feel like I'm <laughs> kind of old enough now to make it maybe something interesting. I've yeah. grown out my natural hair and I have some salt and pepper and silvers and I'm 46 and I guess I feel like that's a little different from the mainstream model mm -hmm. and so it's not really something I do a lot in my time but if I get a call, I'll, I, I'll <laughs> front up because I'm not going to be ageist about myself or other people. Mm -hmm. So someone wants to photograph me, sure, bring it on. So being all of those things, mm. wh what is it that you think that some people, I guess mostly men, mm. find sort of threatening about that? <laughs> that, you, that you can be all of those things. <laughs> hmm. Where to start? Where, Where do we start? go from <laughs> there? Look, I, I'm not sure. I've never understood how I could be threatening. I, I understand that I'm direct and that I'm and tall and I'm bold and not a wallflower, but that's all the best people, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, actually, you can be any kind of person. You can be very introverted, which I also ma am, actually, um, and be a marvelous human being. So I've never quite understood the threat, but I suppose it centers on something else that, that Billy sort of thinks about here, how th in 1946 is an attempt to return to stability and the status quo and to kind of go back in time and have things very easily explained and put into those boxes. And I guess I don't like to be put in boxes. I don't fit in those boxes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in, in um, holding up the status quo. So if anything, I'd say that is what's threatening. Anytime we, uh, we you know, break through the status quo mm. or we don't respect the status quo, that's a threatening thing. Mm. And it doesn't have to be from a woman, it can be from anyone. But certainly there are very specific uh, status quo issues relating to, to women, and we can see that historically. Mm. So, 
Yeah, I think it has much more to do with change. Yes. And yes. Um, the illusion of, you know, whatever is supposed to be normal and that, you know, I just, I just don't respect it. I just think mm. it's nonsense. Mm. I'm going to be how I'm going to be. This is how I come. Mm. Mm. Which brings me to your second yes. book, which is called Speaking Out, mm. which many of you ha may have read. Um, and in that book, you provide the following statistics. You say, worldwide, less than one out of every four people we hear from or about in the media is female, and men outnumber women in parliament by more than three to one. <coughs> if half of humanity's experiences, perspectives, and possible solutions to world problems are underrepresented or entirely unheard, all of us lose out. I really believe that. Yeah. I believe we're stronger together. I mean, literally all of us, whatever gender you identify with, male, female, or any other gender, we are all in this together, you know? Mm. I think it's the divisions between human beings that harm, and I think it's the ranking of humans that harm and lead to some of the worst human rights atrocities, including mm. the Holocaust. This whole book really, one of the major themes throughout it is about the dangers of ranking humans, whether it means male, female, or different race, whether it means able-bodied, not able-bodied, all of these things are about ranking who's better, who's more mm -hmm. worthy. The fact that we don't, and I say we, I mean as a culture, we still don't have a sense of equality, we still rank one another, and it's hugely damaging, and the w events of World War II would not have happened if not for this ranking of humans. So I believe that the, the messages in this book are relevant today and those, you know, it's a continuation of sorts of all of the non-fiction work that I've been doing. Mm. It, mm. All of my books have these through lines in them, mm. and I have different ways of approaching these topics. And for mm. this, I felt this historical period was particularly poignant for that discussion of mm. this ranking, this really damaging, yeah. unnecessary thing that mm. uh, in human history we've done a lot mm. of. And I think particularly with in regards to women, um, I mean, I think you look at both ends of the spectrum. So yeah. you look at older women and, you know, who are maybe starting to mm. be invisible or, be yes. or feel like they're invisible. Yep. And then you also look at younger women and how important it is for them mm. to learn to speak out, to mm. really be confident and have that ability to speak their minds. And to be heard. And to be heard. And to be yeah. heard. And we're not as good at listening to women. I mean, statistically, mm. I'm, I'm, you're all listening to me right now, which is <laughs> ace. Um, <laughs> Which is great, but statistically speaking, and always it's important to keep looking at the bigger picture, mm. because mm. of course we can say, oh, there's not enough women directors. Wait a second, Patty Jenkins directed Wonder Woman. Mm. There's a movie about women, and it's great, and there's a women director. It's completely ace, but it's still not the One. norm, mm. right? It's mm. breakout and amazing because of that. And, um, and by the way, it did great at the box office, and hello, Hollywood, you should be doing more of this, right? But we can always take individual examples, and pretend that they represent the bigger picture, but that's why I'm so interested in stats and data and why in my nonfiction books there's all these sexy endnotes. <laughs> I have like <laughs> pages and pages of endnotes because I think it's important to look at the bigger picture yeah. always um, and the context and kind of, you know, see how that fits in, how your individual experience or this indiv individual example fits into the bigger mm. picture. Mm. Great. Look, I think that's a really good place for us to finish, although I do have another page of questions. <laughs> um, but I think the audience might have some questions as well. Wonderful. So I think we have a I roving... So. Do we have a roving mic? Oh, we do. We have two. So if you'd like to ask a question of Tara, just put your hand up. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I was uh, kind of curious about uh, your influences because um, I guess that, like, anything that's kind of, like, detective related in the 40s is immediately going to, um, people are going to take it as like, you know, in the Chandler-esque mold or sure. like just through the osmosis of that style and that character, which yeah. I'm guessing you're aware of because you said that you like Chandler and Noir I love and Chandler and um, he's mentioned in my acknowledgements and I've named the dancers, this club for the dancers in Raymond Chandler. So it's a bit, there's definitely a lot of reference to Chandler. Like, uh, what are the kind of, like, degrees in which you wanted to, like, steer into that style and the mm. ones where you wanted to, like, subvert it or go in a different direction? That's a wonderful question. Um, I guess you're looking at an author who loves the genre. I'm a diehard, hard-boiled fan, but also wants to subvert the genre for the things that mm. I feel like it lacked. Um, 
when I was researching for this book, I tried to look for uh, contemporary material from the time. And for example, the only female detective I could find in fiction in the 40s was um, the Gail Gallagher books. You probably haven't heard of them because they're out of print, which again goes back to my mm. previous uh, comments. Gail Gallagher was actually a, a husband and wife team, and they wrote two uh, detective books about a female character named Gail Gallagher, who was a PI in the 40s. Um, I Found Him Dead and Cord and Crimson are the two novels. Again, out of print, not celebrated, not kind of repeated, but really great books. Um, and there were private investigators in the 40s who were women. They weren't the norm, again, and Billy's not the norm, and today that's still the case among private investigators. But they're there, and they did exist in the 40s as well. Really interesting women with, in fact, quite colorful. <laughs> You'll be <laughs> unsurprised to hear. Um, so I was interested in looking at those original hard-boiled um, stories. I was interested in subverting them then and kind of making them my own and making, yes, referencing them because I, I love those books. So to both, I don't know if it's uh, praise and critique at the same time or just um, you know, wanting to fit into that genre and reimagine it um, by putting a, a female character front and center and she's not just you know, someone's love interest or a victim. She's the woman who's running the show, and she's also surrounded by other women who are the heroes of their own subplots. Mm. That was important to me. Mm. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, at the top of this um, session, they mentioned that you're doing a doctorate right now. Mm. So is your scholarly research influencing your fiction and your nonfiction work, or is mm. that quite a separate research project? So I'm doing um, a Doctor of Social Sciences at the University of Sydney. Uh, it's part-time, and when, I, when you say I'm doing it right now, I'm not doing it right <laughs> this minute, <laughs> but I am working on it. I'm about three and a half years into the work, and um, I don't like to talk too much about things that I are so far from completion, but there's definitely, obviously, gender and cultural studies department, there's, there's crossover with all the other interests you see me writing about, and I think my academic studies have helped to hone my research skills and helped me to maybe delve even more deeply um, into these uh, topics that I'm so passionate about. They certainly had very direct um, influences on the fictional woman and speaking out, and with Billy Walker, it's like the fictional version of, you know, again, picking up all these historical details, um, looking at things I can research for days and go down that rabbit hole, mm. um, but ultimately come up with a fiction novel at the end. So mm. not giving too much away, but yeah, it all is very much influencing my writing in, in all sorts of ways. Mm. Thank you. Fabulous vintage okay. here, I just want to point out. <laughs> uh, just in relation to the vintage thing, Yes. Do there are a lot of stereotypes around women in the 1940s, mm. lots and lots of stereotypes coming out of the war. Did you find that in researching that you had to challenge some of your own thinking mm -hmm. about stereotypes that, were crea that have been created around these women over time? Were you surprised at some of the things that you were finding or mm. did it kind of fit with, the with your thinking of how they were? I'm always surprised by uh, my research and I guess if I wasn't, I wouldn't be as avid a researcher. Like I want to be surprised and uncover things I didn't already know. It's pretty hard to shock me these days though, <laughs> I'll be honest. And, and if anything, it what I came across again and again did seem to kind of confirm some of my earlier research that we've got these incredible women, they're just kind of not household names. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just seen that so often, it's not a pattern I'm probably likely to unsee. Um, if anything, the research, it's not so much that it shocked me, it's that the details are just so intricate and wonderful and fascinating. Um, I can't help but notice you're wonder wearing wonderful vintage, and one of the things I wanted to do in this book as well is to talk about make, do, and mend, 
and to again apply that a little bit to how we um, how we consider garments and objects today. Mm. Um, so Billy, again, she's mending and she's fixing things, and those material um, items, they're not frivolous, they're not superficial, they tell us a little bit about the character. And going back to Chandler, who I was mentioning earlier, I remember an early um, criticism I had from a reviewer um, it was a male reviewer, that might have been irrelevant, but I think in this case probably wasn't. And he uh, really focused on the fact that I talked often about what the characters were wearing. Mm -hmm. And all I want to do is say, read some Philip Marlowe novels, right? Because Marlowe looks at a character and clocks every single element of what they're wearing, often down to, down to the brand and the, whether the shoes are shined or not, what part there is in the hair. I mean, every detail is, is, is clocked by Philip Marlowe because it's relevant, because it tells us something about the characters. And so I've done that in, in Dead Man Switch. And those details, I think, for me, help to bring these characters even more mm. to life. And yeah, I was always finding something new and interesting and different in that process. What's being rationed, what isn't. Mm. You know, at the beginning of the book, they've only started having the, the lift go up from the lobby again. It went up from the first floor previously to conserve energy. All these little details. Um, there was still petrol rationing in 1946. All these little details. I went down absolute rabbit hole for research. And Which is a problem for her because she yep. loves driving. She loves <laughs> driving, and as she well should because she's got a beautiful Willie's Roadster, um, <laughs> which does come into play later, which is lots of fun. So, so yeah, I wasn't shocked by the women or surprised by them. I was just delighted by um, every bit of new information I could get about the mm. people from the time. And also that, yeah, that broader context. We've probably got time for about two more quick questions, I think. Yeah. Hi, Tara. Hi. Um, I know that you're a fan of Kerry and you're doing a, a, yes. a um, thing with her in Tasmania. Kerry Greenwood. Yes. Yes. Um, and of course, Franny, yes. who I adore. Um, As do I. I know, because we talk online a lot. Yes. But um, do you um, f hope that Billy ends up being the 40s Franny? I mean, mm. she's her own person, I get that. I'm, yes. not, I'm not saying that she's the same, which a lot of people who've reviewed it have, and mm -hmm. she's not. Um, but have a lot like of people who've reviewed it I've said she's a, like I've Franny? Read a lot of, um, reviews I haven't seen that like yet. Franny. Yes, mm. sorry. But like just I think she's more like a private dick without the dick, I would <laughs> say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, okay, but yeah, I get the, that the she's the, the female and a, and a private investigator, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so there's going to be comparisons. And stylish and drives yeah. a really cool car and wears really yeah. cool clothes and yeah. what have you. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, so, um, but, but because it's the 40s, she's mm. doing her own stuff, whereas Franny of had Doc. Of course. But yeah, uh, yeah. Just, are you hoping for that sort of, let's have a TV series so that I can... I would love to have TV. a TV series. <laughs> if you're a producer, you are can you call offering? me. <laughs> um, I'd love to see her on the big screen. I'd love to see Billy Walker on the big screen, and there's um, talk of that at the moment, and we'll see what happens. There's also talk about the Mac Van Der Waal series um, as adaptations, so I'm hopeful. But of course, I write books to be books, and if they you know, are adapted into some other form, that's wonderful as well. Um, as a great um, fan of, of Carrie Greenwood's books, yes, I love Franny, but I don't see the style of this book or the character as being the same as what Carrie Greenwood is aiming to achieve or does achieve in her books. Um, the Franny books are just, a, if you haven't read them, you should, but the tone is different and this, the length is different and the, the way, the kind of the world is different. I think she's making very specific feminist choices as a writer and, um, and it works beautifully for Franny, but it's, it's I, I would argue, very different from what you find when you're reading Billy Walker. In fact, someone was, um, at a launch the other day, they were saying, you know, who who is this most like? And they kind of threw out some names. And I was like, I actually kind of hope that when you read this, you haven't read this book before. You don't have the feeling that you've read this book before or this character, but that she nonetheless feels like she rings true. Mm. So that's what I'm hoping for. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right, maybe one more question. And then um, Tara obviously is available to sign books afterwards. Yes. I would be delighted. She would be delighted to sign It's books taken afterwards. me years. This is my <laughs> um, first novel after seven years of doing nonfiction and I really 
wanted to take my time after Mac Vanderwall, a character I really love and who launched me as a writer. I wanted to take my time to rethink about the the character, particularly who is going to be my new central character. What is the setting? What am I trying to, you know, bring to life here? And it's exciting. The book has only been out for a week, and this is, you know, one of my first audiences with people. Some of you have actually managed to read some of it. It's a real delight as an author. Mm -hmm. It's 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 new, and um, it's like my baby's out yeah, in the world. It's out in the world. <laughs> be kind. Be kind. Okay, <laughs> we've got one more at the back there. Hello, Tara. Hi. I was just going to ask. As you've grown up in North America and then moved to Australia, how mm. do you find the, the difference, um, the relations between men and women? Like I find mm. personally sometimes um, it can be a bit derogatory or put down, um, if just even me growing up here. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't lived overseas and mm. I'm just wondering, have you encountered differences like that? It's a great question and a great hair flower. I know I'm mentioning the clothes, but I've already put it out there that I notice these <laughs> things, and I think they're relevant. Um, yes, there are differences. Um, I love Australians, and I love Canadians, and I'm a dual citizen. Um, I don't think it's irrelevant that the Trudeau government, you know, when they put in their first cabinet, they had gender parity, and they had a pretty multicultural uh, cabinet straight off the bat. And I think that was... Forgive me if I'm wrong, I want to say 2014, 2013, mm -hmm. something like that. We can do that here in Australia. We have the women, we have mm. the people, the diverse people to have a gender parity in my, our cabinet. Um, Cass was mentioning earlier that statistic about how we hear um, and read about, hear from and about fewer than you know, one out of every four people being, being a, a woman, so it's 24% of the people we hear from worldwide or hear about worldwide are women. Um, and probably some of you are thinking, yeah, but that's worldwide, Australia is better than that. It's 24% also mm. here. And again, um, in our parliament, that's a, you know, another representation that you can look to for that. So yeah, I think there are definitely improvements that need to be made. But it's not, um, it's not like in every circle, in every business, in every uh, suburb where you see the same inequalities, it varies. And y hopefully you're really lucky and you live in a community that uh, shows quite equal representation and quite diverse representation of people. But there are definitely big improvements to be made across the board. Um, another one of the uh, stats I always find interesting is you know, who we choose to make statues of because it's, again, another representation of what we hold up. And I'm often told, you know, maybe women just don't want to be in politics, they want to be leaders. I think that's nonsense, but sure, that can be your argument. And usually the same argument finishes with, yeah, but we put them, we really, we put them on pedestals. And I'm telling you that we, like, literally actually don't, because <laughs> they're not. So 85% <laughs> of the statues in Australia are of men. Uh, the 15% um, the that are of women are largely of allegorical figures from Greek and Roman mythology. So it's, you know, virtue, it's faith. Mm -hmm. It's not an actual woman that we're celebrating where we can have her name on there and say, look at what this incredible person mm -hmm. did. Um, and a huge number of the, that 15% that are actually historical figures are of the same historical figure, which is, of course, the queen. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> we do have some ways to go. Uh, and that's, you know, Australia is no orphan in that respect. There are issues around the world. But yeah, I think, I think we can all band together yes. and improve some of those stats so that next time I come here, I'll go, you know all those stats I was talking about in 2019? <laughs> Holy cow, we blitzed well that. <laughs> blitzed Change that. You. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> all right. I'm going to ask for some guidance from Jane, wherever she is, to... Oh, there she is. Um, have we run out of question time? I think we have. <laughs> so that's probably a very good place to finish. Everybody, thank please thank Tara Moss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tass. Oh, Tass. <laughs> Tass. We are. We, we Tass. said we were going to connect. We, we really are attached. so connected. <laughs> we're now Tass. I love it. Gosh, um, Tara and Cass for that wonderful discussion. Um, as an emerging writer myself, it's so inspiring to hear from smart um, female 
authors talking about their female-centred work. So um, that was uh, such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you. Uh, please do not forget that Talking Ideas has three more events for 2019 that are not to be missed. On Wednesday evening, Mem Fox is in conversation with Trent Dalton. Yes. On the 9th of November, Anna Funder looks back at Stasiland. And on the 11th of November, Dr. Carl shares more mind-blowing science. I would like to remind you that Dead Man Switch is for sale in the foyer and you can have your own book personally signed by Tara. Signed copies of Tara's other books, as well as Cass's novels, Parting Words and The Promise Seed, as well as my novel, The Yellow House, will be available to purchase. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you.